Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. It's good to have you with us this morning. I have a few announcements for you. Welcome. Uh, Just to note on the back of your, in your bulletin, the schedule isn't quite right, but the things that are wrong on it don't necessarily pertain to you. So that's the good thing. Um, Next Sunday, we will be having one worship service. It will be here at 1030. So your service time does not change, okay? Um, I will be gone on vacation next week, and I will be gone on Sunday. So you are having a uh, per- Leanne, Luann, not Leanne, Luann Newman is coming. She was a ELCA missionary, and she's going to come tell about her missionary journey, preach, and um, have some fun, and she lives in Prairie du Chien, and so she's going to be here, and so we're going to do, rather than doing two services, one at Gates Mills at 9 and one here at 1030, we are going to do a joint service, but do it at the 1030 time, so you guys don't move, you just show up. Okay, that's what I said. It doesn't really pertain to you because you've been coming at 1030, and you will continue to come at 1030, but you will have Gates Mills people here, which is a kind of exciting, um, and so... We invite them to be here. I will be gone this week, um, starting on Wednesday, and I will be back the next Wednesday, so I'll be gone for a whole week. Pastor Meg Hooverston is on call. Um, Her number is in the bulletin. If there is a pastoral emergency, she's the one to call. You can call other pastors in the area. Um, Pastor Lori in DeSoto and Freeman may be in the area, but I didn't talk to her. So that's why I'm saying she's the one who technically is on call. I believe Pastor Trump just got back from vacation, so he would also be someone that you could contact. Pastor Sandine is on sabbatical, so he is not in the area and not um, available. But um, Pastor Meg lives in Viroqua, so she is close and she would be able to come um, if you had a pastoral emergency. To note that our uh, mask requirement has changed. So if you are vaccinated, if you are comfortable, you don't have to wear a mask. If you are unvaccinated, please wear a mask. Um, you will note that I will probably, the, if the, when I am standing or in amongst people, I will be wearing my mask. That's part of having a wonderful autoimmune disease that means I'm immunocompromised and I need to wear a mask when I am in the midst of people. I'm not so, if we're all vaccinated, then I'm not so uncomfortable, but I can still uh, get the virus, and so that's why I need to be careful. And so I will take it off when I'm up here, but when I'm out talking to people, I'm perfectly comfortable having my mask on and just to note that. That's nothing about you. It's all about trying to keep me safe. (laughs) So are there other, uh, and also a thank you from Judy. So I invite you to read that. Thank you. Thank you. She says for all of the cards and well wishes on her retirement. Uh, Yes. Yes. And you will note today that we are still sort of pinch hitting. Yes, we are looking at a new, try, getting a new organist. Pastor Kerry didn't get time to sit down and have a conversation about that with the person we're asking. So <laughs> um, we're, it's in process, it, um, and we're working on um, having a new pianist. Today we are going to sing. We are going to try to sing with the recording. It was all right in gaze mills <laughs> just to know it is not my preference which is why we are looking for an organist um, and so we are in that process are there other announcements from the congregation this morning if not let us begin with our uh, invocation We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin 
receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And Let us pray. O God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <laughs> and you can take off your mask to read. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who have shepherded my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many, many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And so they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. And now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as they went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country, villages, and buy something to eat. But Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. 
And they just said to him, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, many, how many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples and set them before the people. He divided the two fish among them, and all ate and were filled. They took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish, and those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. When they had crossed over and they came to a land at Gesenaret and moored the boat, when they had gotten out of the boat, people recognized Jesus, and they rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to whatever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into the villages or the cities or the farms, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might even touch the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. You will, if you go home and uh, look up the gospel reading, you will notice, one, that the reading in the, the bulletin is a split reading. There are verses here and there are verses here. You will also notice that Pastor Carrie read those verses and some more. Because <laughs> I added the feeding of the 5,000 to this story. Um, we, in the middle of the verses, so the verses are supposed to be Jesus going out into the deserted place, people following him, and then him healing people. What we skip in the middle is the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking, uh, Jesus walking on water, which means that if you notice in the gospel reading, there's a little bit of a jump that seemed weird. Well, that was because we chopped out a story out of there. Um, you have to wait a couple years before we preach on the Jesus walking on water. We don't read it here in the gospel of Mark. We will read it in the Mark here, which is, or Luke, Matthew year, there's, a, there's one of those Gospels, um, which is in a few years. And then we get the wonderful part of the story where Peter also walks on the water. A few weeks ago, Jesus sent out his disciples, the twelve, two by two. Take no bag, take no money, depend on the uh, hospitality of strangers, and... Preach, proclaim repentance of their sins, cast out demons, and heal the sick. Those were the tasks that they were given. Then we take a pause in the forward motion of the story, and we read about Herod the Great, or not Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, and his uh, horrible, beautiful banquet where he beheads John the Baptist. And then we skip forward in the story, and we return... And now we have the disciples coming back from going off to heal the sick, cast out demons, and proclaim repentance for, the sin, for their sins. And what we get is a lot of excitement. Why? Because people listened. Because people were healed. Demons were cast out. Because people repented of their sins. This is a moment of wow, this worked. This ministry is going well. And there's excitement, and there's almost energy behind it. But Jesus also knows that that was a lot of work. Doing ministry is a lot of work. And they need a little bit of rest. 
It was so much so that they, there were so many people that were coming to Jesus that they can't even find a moment to eat or a moment to even rest or be. And that is telling. This story emphasizes the pieces that we read today emphasize how much need there is for people to meet Jesus. To the point that when they go off to be by themselves in the deserted place, what do people do? Well, they catch wind of where Jesus is going and they meet him there. Before Jesus even gets there, people are all over the place meeting him. And when he goes to Gethsemane, where are the people? They bring their sick into the marketplace and just lay them there, hoping that maybe they could touch Jesus' cloak. The enormity of the amount of people who are in need of Jesus is huge. And this following, this group of people who are coming together, it is massive. So it makes sense that there should be a moment, a pause, rest. The kingdom of God can wait a little bit while these weary feet and mind rest. But that's not what happens. I'm not a huge fan of the story in that sense because that's not what happens. Pastors like to talk a lot about rest and relax and sabbath why because we're not very good at it (laughs) and we sometimes like to talk about things we're not very good at we're not very good at taking time away and we're not very good at setting boundaries and not being available when we're taking our time away and where did we learn it from well maybe jesus because he's also not very good about taking time away and resting when he needs it But this is that moment when it it shows that the need is so great that there's not really any ability to rest. They come ashore and Jesus sees the great crowd and he has compassion for them. Now, compassion is an interesting word. It's not used all that often in Scripture, even to describe Jesus. We usually think of compassion as something where I care for and love someone else. I have compassion for them, right? But actually, compassion has yet another meaning. Um, To have compassion for someone is to suffer with them. That's the Greek tendency towards this word. To have compassion for someone is to suffer with them. We just talked about the great amount of suffering and need that is among these people. And so Jesus sees them, and he sees their suffering, and he gathers the crowd, and he suffers with them. He doesn't just love them, but he loves them so much that he's willing to take on their suffering. He doesn't rest. Rather, he comes among them. He suffers with them. He will heal them, he will teach them, he will feed them. Those are important things that become a part of who Jesus is in this story. And why does he do that? Well, he says, Mark reminds us that Jesus sees them and they are like sheep without a shepherd. And we go, oh, that's really nice, because we like Jesus as the good shepherd from John. We also like uh, the psalm 23 where the lord is my shepherd which is the appointed psalm for today just so you know but you can go home and read that so we like these images of shepherds but it is bigger than that i think we don't always realize how biblically these terms live within scripture the old testament is filled with places that talk about shepherding and shepherds shepherding and shepherds are synonymous with king in the Old Testament. So Jeremiah, the test read that scripture today, talks about the shepherds. They're talking about the kings. Ezekiel will also talk about shepherds. He also will talk about kings and shepherds and them being the same. Shepherds are a common figure in the Bible and as a metaphor for a king. 
Shepherds are to be responsible and provide sustenance for their flock. They are to keep peace within the flock. They are to defend them from attackers. They are to search for the sheep that go astray, and they are to rescue those in danger. Our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah tells us of God's anger over the leaders of God's people because they are being bad shepherds. They are not doing the things I just listed. They are not attending to the people's needs. They do not respond in compassion. Each king, Jeremiah reminds us, has, ex- has failed to execute justice in the morning and to deliver from the hand of the oppressor those who have been robbed. He's contrasting them to King Josiah. So, After King Solomon dies, the kingdom splits in two because he's got a snotty son who won't listen to people, okay? And he puffs off his chest, and guess what? That creates a rebellion, and the northern kingdom splits away. The northern kingdom is named Israel, and they never have a good king, never one that follows God, not a one. Um, they are taken over by the Assyrians in the 700s BC, 700 years before Jesus. And so then we're left with the southern kingdom. Now, the southern kingdom has a few good kings. King Josiah is one of them. They will fail to follow, which is why Jeremiah is preaching to them, because they have strayed from God, and they have had a lot of bad shepherds, and in the 500 BC, 500 years before Jesus, the Babylonians will invade them. But here, in this moment, Jeremiah is trying to get them to change their ways and return to God. And so he reminds them that, Je- that Josiah was the one who judged the cause of the poor and the needy. He was one who had the eyes and the heart, is how Jeremiah speaks of it. King Josiah saw the people, and his heart responded. He saw their need, and his heart opened and he responded to them. Unlike Josiah's sons and grandsons, who had dishonest gain, was all about shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence. We tried. We got a few good ones, and then the sons seemed to pray. And so God calls out for a compassionate shepherd who will willingly suffer with the people and thus see their pain and respond with the heart and seek justice for them. This is all God wants in Jeremiah, compassionate shepherds. You see, a shepherd isn't just supposed to lead the flock of sheep. The shepherd spends night and day with the sheep. If it rains, guess who gets to be wet? The sheep and the shepherd. If it is hot, guess who gets to be hot? The shepherd. I have this image that will always be born in my brain that of a shepherd is when I was in Palestine and Israel, we were going to Masada. So this is in seminary, this is 15 some years ago. We were going to Masada. Masada is in the southern part south of Jerusalem. It is... uh, Herod Antipas, or Herod the Great's big castle that he built out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and so he, uh, we're driving, and think sort of South Dakota Badlands. That's sort of the rocky desert, not a whole lot of trees. The Jordan Valley is not far away, and that is very grassy, very lush, very green, beautiful. And so shepherds will often bring their sheep down to the Jordan Valley. They'll eat. Um, They'll drink, and then they'll take them back up into the Palestinian place, uh, um, up into this sort of badlands area, and that's where they'll hang out. And so we are driving through. It's 95-some degrees outside, and we're on this tour bus that's thankfully (laughs) air-conditioned. 
and I look out and there is the shepherd and he's got this flock of sheep and goats and a camel or two. And he is sitting there, he's about 12 years old, and he's sitting up on this rock in the sun. Remember, sheep are hot, shepherd is hot. That's how it works. And so he's up there in this sun, and he's watching his sheep. And I thought to myself, why doesn't he just go down and sit in the shade of the rock? Because that's what I would do. And I asked the tour guide, and he said, but then he can't see the sheep. Right? That's what the shepherd are to do. Sitting up on top of the rock, he could see all the sheep. Sitting down underneath the rock in the shade, he would miss his sheep, not be able to watch him. Shepherds suffer with the sheep. Why? Because that's their job. Protect and care for them. Be with them. Be the ones to protect them, to watch over them. The most interesting and surprising piece of the gospel reading for today is that when Jesus sees the crowds and has compassion for them, because they are like sheep without a shepherd, the first thing he does is not feed them, though that's the part we like. The first thing he does is he teaches them. Jesus' first reaction and first action of shepherding is that he will teach God's people. Then he will feed them. He will sit them down in the wilderness. And he will take bread. And he will bless it. And he will break that bread. And he will give it to them. And all will be fed. And all will partake in the miracle of bread. And all will be filled. It should remind you of something. Because our worship service on a Sunday morning is modeled after Jesus' own actions. We come, we teach, we talk, we engage in scripture. You get a lot of Pastor Carrie waving her arms around and doing that a lot today, I realized. <laughs> and then we go to the table. We're... God feeds us. This is the action of a shepherd. All the actions of the shepherds in Jeremiah have failed to do this, to act with compassion, to suffer with the people. And it's beautiful to see Jesus and his actions and to say, okay, that's the good shepherd, that's what it is. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. But I do want to back us up and hold us back a little bit because Jeremiah isn't first and foremost about Jesus. If you know that, Jeremiah call, that in Jeremiah, God calls and says, I will appoint shepherds, not a shepherd, but shepherds, multiple of them. And I think that's important to recognize, is that what God will do is first care for the people. God says, I'll do that first, and then I will appoint shepherds over you. And that will be people, not just Jesus, but actual kings and priests and people who will guide and shepherd the people. And that that then translates into our own time. We too have people who shepherd us. And I do know that some of you are like, yep, that's Pastor Kerry. But I'm going to push you a little bit on that too, because yes, I am a shepherd. But I think also our council are shepherds who lead and guide us in decisions and how to care for one another. But I also think you are shepherds. You are called to guide and to model your faith for others. I think about the young people in your life, especially, but also for those who are in this community who haven't darkened the doors of this church in a while or uh, never. And how you yourself are a shepherd to them and model and care for them how you worship and how you live out your faith and how you teach and God, about God in word and action and how that is a part of our calling 
that we are called to be shepherds to others, to have compassion for and to suffer with those who may be sheep, either learning or lost, or those who are in need of our care and guidance. We are called to follow Jesus' example. And sometimes that means laying aside our weariness to teach and to feed God's people in the world. Sound like a little overwhelming? Maybe even a little impossible? Well, welcome to ministry. One of the things I remember being told in seminary is that one, your work will never be done, and two, you will never feel like you know what you're doing. <laughs> And I, after 13 years, would wholeheartedly agree with that. <laughs> and that's the reality. We are called to be followers of Christ, to be Christians, to follow Jesus. And that is not always easy. What it calls us to do is to have eyes and hearts to love the people of God with everything we have, and most importantly, to see them as that. I will remind you, though, that the reason we are called is because Jesus is first and foremost the Good Shepherd. He is a shepherd who will not just suffer with the sheep, but will suffer instead of the sheep, the one who will save the people, the good shepherd who will be our righteousness, taking on our sin and the cross and giving us his glory, his life, his righteousness, his forgiveness, his salvation. This is the good shepherd who leads us here to be taught by his holy scriptures to sing his beautiful songs, to come to his table where we will dine with bread and wine, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, where we are forgiven and given a foretaste of the feast to come. We are brought here, where we are surrounded by fellow sheep and shepherds who are sometimes just as lost as we are, and sometimes are the ones who give us a hand up as we pray and care and love and protect and care for one another. The Good Shepherd who calls us, who loves us, who continues to be the one who shepherds us, is sheep. Amen. We're going to sing. So, red hymnal. 742. Seven hundred and forty two. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. So we don't quite have an organist yet. What we have is if you watched us online, do you remember the guy who played guitar sometimes, Nathan Drake? He's, we're, I'm going to play him singing this, and we're going to try to sing along with him. It sort of worked in Gay's Mouth. <laughs> um, he has the same words. It's, the guitar is the hard part, is because you don't hear the tune. So you just got to kind of go with him. He's going to be, he, the speaker is behind us. So um, you just kind of go with him, and I'll, I'll sing too. Um, the, the one thing about words, hymnal says you, um, and mine, he says thee and thou. So he does the old school. Feel free to just sing whatever the hymnal has. I sang it the other day with it that way, and it did not bother me or really be all that different. So if you hear him sing a little different to words, that's what it is. All the rest of the words are exactly the same, so... I 
sins and griefs to bear What a privilege you carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, a peace we often forfeit this pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer How we trials and and heavy laden come but with a load of care precious Savior still our refuge take it to the Lord in prayer do thy friends despise forsake thee take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee Thou will find a solace there Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all those in need. O oh God, tend to your church. Encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel. Raise up new leaders and encourage those pursuing a call to ministry. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and grace and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Restore your creation, O God. Sustain croplands and pastures. Safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that are our refreshment. Revive the lands, especially those that are recovering from natural disasters. We lift before you all those who suffer drought, wildfire, and the floods. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reconcile the nations, O God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats to seek peaceful solutions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal your people, O oh God. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or lost. Give rest to those who are suffering. Comfort those who are grieving. And offer healing and peace to those who are ill. Gracious God, we pray especially for Luann. Tyler, Mike, Sandy, Cooper, Tolene, Debbie, Lola, Elling, Chris, Mary, Peggy, Herbie, Amora, Jim, 
Tammy, Joe, and Jeannie. Lord, in your mercy, Gracious God, nourish this congregation. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to one another and to this community that we may be your shepherds and your sheep. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us home, O God. We give you thanks for those who have died and now citizens with the saints. And as we have received them, as you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us to dwell in your house forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lift, we lift those and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. At this time, we will be doing communion, and so I invite you, if you didn't get communion on the way in, to go grab some, otherwise to find your communion cups. So I invite you that when I lift up the bread, feel free to hold up your little wafer if you would like. Um, when I lift the cup, feel free to hold your cup up. Um, we will eat and partake of Holy Communion after the Lord's Prayer. So we kind of do the words, we pray over it, and then um, we partake or eat of the elements as we call them. So uh, please stand if you are able. The Lord be with you. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one more. 
So 884, also known as the doxology, 884. There are no tune to it because it's seen as a familiar tune, um, but the words are there. So we're going to sing it three times. So I've, I've got Nathan Drake playing for us again, and so he sings it three times through. So we're going to do three times um, with this one. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Here 